History as it happens, May 19th, 2022. The history of abortion. And a landmark ruling, the Supreme Court today legalized abortion. After that comparatively so safe three-month period, abortions may be regulated, but not prohibited by Robert state Robert Bork's America is a land in which women would be forced into back alley abortions. You really believe Black that you can find uh, anywhere a general right of privacy. Is this a person who thinks the premier woman's right is the right to kill her unborn baby? Do you want to see the court overturn Roe v. Well, if we put another two or perhaps three justices on, that's really what's going to be, that will happen. Before Roe v. Wade, most states banned abortion. Long before the courts recognized a right to privacy, abortion was considered a private matter. And it was commonplace in colonial America for women to end their pregnancies under the common law. Law. That history is once again part of our present, as the Supreme Court appears poised to overturn Roe. And that's next, as we report History As It Happens, a podcast from The Washington Times. I'm Martin DeCaro. I will defend Roe v. Wade, and I will defend One of the important things right to today. keep in mind about Roe v. Wade is that it has been reaffirmed many times. It's reaffirmed in Casey in 1992 and in several other cases. I don't have any agenda. I have no agenda to try to overrule Casey. Um, I have an agenda to stick to the rule of law and decide cases as they come. So it was up to the woman's bodily experience and of course could vary from woman to woman, could vary from, you know, fetus to fetus. Really both the law and the medical profession relied on women's bodily experiences to tell them if a pregnancy had in fact occurred and when it had occurred and whether or not that pregnancy was viable. In 1866, Congress passed the 14th Amendment. The states ratified it two years later. It says, in part, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. It was not until the 20th century when the Supreme Court began to read the liberty guarantee as a broad privacy right, and in 1965 in Connecticut v. Griswold, the court established an implied right to privacy in the Constitution. And then eight years later, Roe v. Wade, which pointed directly to the 14th Amendment. But long before Americans developed legal or constitutional arguments for or against abortion, long before Robert Bork in his 1987 Supreme Court confirmation hearing argued there was no general right to privacy in the Constitution. Well, it would seem to me, Senator, that it would be easier to argue a right to an abortion. I'm not saying it would work, but it would be easier to do that than it would be to find this generalized right of privacy. And, for example, I understand groups are working. I I haven't seen their work product, but I am told that groups are working on that. For example, some groups, I think, are trying an equal protection argument. Only women have this uh, specific burden, and forcing a woman to carry a baby to term, some of the groups are arguing, I suppose, is a form of gender discrimination. Centuries before legalized abortion became one of the most polarizing issues in our politics, abortion was commonplace in colonial America. And in what we today might call the first trimester of pregnancy, it wasn't very controversial either, not until the middle of the 19th century. Roe v. Wade cites this history of the common law that allowed women to end their pregnancies before what was called quickening. Justice Alito presents a different version of abortion history in his draft opinion overturning Roe. So why does this history matter? So what if abortions were unregulated in, say, 1750? Well, the American Historical Association, in its amicus brief filed in the Dobbs case, said the history and traditions of the United States inform modern abortion jurisprudence and deserve great weight. So history isn't mere fodder for discussion. It brings its own force, its own weight to solving or not solving our dilemmas and disputes. So if we're going to try to understand what's going on right now, whatever your position on abortion is, it helps to know where all this came from, whether you begin in colonial America or in 1866. The purpose of the 14th Amendment is it's part of a general effort on the part of Congress to, in a sense, to use a modern phrase, regime change. 
Historian Eric Foner, author of Reconstruction, America's Unfinished Revolution, 1863 to 1877. He was the first person who came to mind when I started to think about who to talk to about the 14th Amendment, so we are thrilled he is here. Our conversation is coming up in a little bit. We're going to start by returning to an era that you might not associate with abortion rights. But this is why my podcast exists. Suddenly, with another turn in the news cycle, what happened when the states were just British colonies matters again. Anna Peterson is a historian at Luther College. She is an expert on women's history, as well as immigration and social history, all of which converge here. To explain how, by the end of the 19th century, all abortions were criminalized across much of the United States. Anna Peterson, welcome. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Why does this history matter here? I mean, Roe versus Wade leans very heavily into history. Justice Alito's draft opinion leans very heavily into history. But how would you respond to someone who says, OK, well, whatever the case may have been in 1802, it's 2022 and we're living today and we have a right to make our laws the way we see fit today? Well, I think in some ways you answered the question and the fact that these rulings have leaned very heavily on history and therefore history matters because they're incorporated into our laws, whether it's the colonial period or it's 2022. In the United States, the laws are based on precedence and precedence is history. So I think that that is an important aspect to consider. And I think that, you know, history informs the present and the ways in which we think about ourselves and think about our lives is very much rooted in the past. The American Historical Association, as you know, put in a amicus or amicus brief, arguing that abortion had been part of common law tradition, that it wasn't a crime in the early United States. They included this sentence in their brief, the history and traditions of the United States inform modern abortion jurisprudence and deserve great weight. I suppose the other side of that argument is, well, what if a decision is wrong? Sure. Well, I think that, too, part of what they're saying And what they end the amicus brief with is that Roe's central conclusion was correct, right? And the reliance that Roe had on the historical record was, in fact, based in evidence and that we have even more evidence since the 1970s, historical evidence, that what Roe relied on was the case, that it was true. Was abortion commonplace in colonial life? Yes. Abortion, as we think of it, was commonplace in colonial society. It was a widespread practice. Women induced their own miscarriages, typically by using herbs or sometimes by purchasing drugs that were advertised in the papers and could be sent to them in the mail. Did they use the term abortion? What was it referred to as? No. So that's why I said abortion as we think of it today, because it's important to note that the term abortion didn't really exist for what I'm describing in this colonial period. Abortion was reserved for induced miscarriages that took place after quickening had occurred. And we can come back to what quickening was. But anything that happened before quickening, any kind of induced miscarriage, was considered a restoration of the body, a restoration of menstruation, rather than what we would maybe think of as like ridding the body of something that was present. They're thinking about restoring the body and restoring menstruation. I think that that seems very odd to those of us today to think about, but it was really the ways in which these women conceptualized their lives and society thought about things was that there was not anything present, let's say a human life was not present until after quickening had occurred. And then after that had occurred, an induced miscarriage would have been termed an abortion. I suppose there may have been people in those days who believe that life began at conception. But I'm glad you brought up that point about the importance of vocabularies, 21st century vocabulary and concepts versus the 18th century, going to be quite different. So what did people believe, what did women believe they were doing when they ended their pregnancies that early, before quickening? Was there a vocabulary about human life or taking a human life? No. And I I would point out that there were maybe some people who believed that human life began at conception, but even the idea of conception itself is not the way that we think of it and could not really be proven 
And that's one of the reasons that everything relied on quickening, which was the first sensations that a woman would feel in the pregnancy, which could in some cases not occur until the 25th week of pregnancy. Before a woman herself felt those sensations, there wasn't believed to be a pregnancy present. Hmm. Rather, it was, again, this kind of lack of something, a lack of menstruation rather than the presence of a fetus. I guess the word conception comes from my Catholic upbringing. <laughs> well, and the Catholics didn't even necessarily think about human life at that stage. They had their own ideas about ensoulment, which could take place at different points if it was a male fetus or a female fetus, but did not occur kind of when the sperm met the egg, but a little bit later into the gestational process. That's interesting. I and mean, we still have these debates today about when life begins or when the fetus becomes a person. Mm -hmm. So... Who conducted these abortions? You mentioned that women often did it themselves. And how did they do that? Because it sounds like taking these potions was dangerous. Yeah. So in most cases, women are doing this themselves or they're operating kind of in community with other women. They kind of talked about it as like a shared secret. This was certainly a private affair, but one that women knew about how to induce miscarriage, particularly if we're talking about the colonial period. They grew some of these herbs in their gardens. Um, a lot of it was pennyroyal, tansy, based on juniper. And they discussed this with women in their intimate circles. But as the 18th century kind of progressed, then we see the commercialization of abortion and the kind of selling of drugs that you could get in the mail. And that's usually with the commercialization of abortion is when we see the danger to women's lives really increasing dramatically. Why is that? Um, well, because there was no regulation of these drugs oh. that were being sold. And in fact, some of the first abortion statutes, like in Illinois, for example, it was about poison control. And that was because women were being poisoned by these abortifacients that they were receiving in the mail and maybe didn't have the correct dosage of, again, because these drugs were not regulated. You said quickening before. Today, that would be what? I feel the baby kicking, something similar to that? Yeah, or the kind of first sensation of fetal movement, which for some women feels like a butterfly. So it didn't necessarily need to be like a forceful kick, but this kind of sensation of fetal movement that a woman would identify as coming from a fetus or from a life within. And this determination, if you will, was left entirely to the woman, right? There was no outside pressure on what was going on there. Right, exactly. So it was up to the woman's bodily experience and of course could vary from woman to woman, could vary from you know fetus to fetus, Really, both the law and the medical profession relied on women's bodily experiences to tell them if a pregnancy had, in fact, occurred and when it had occurred and whether or not that pregnancy was viable. All of that relied on women's bodily experiences of quickening. That begins to change in the mid-19th century. We'll get to that. Let's stay with this period, though, colonial period, start of the American Republic I should have asked you, along with my first question, was abortion commonplace? Was it legal? There's a dispute about this now because of Justice Alito's draft opinion. He claims that it was always a crime. However, the American Historical Association and many others have pointed out that in common law, it was not illegal. What do we mean when we say it was legal under the common law? So at the founding of the United States and for many decades after, Americans relied on English common law which did not regulate abortion in early pregnancy. So the law too acknowledged a fetus as existing separate from a pregnant woman only after quickening had occurred. And so common law also was based on this concept of quickening and based on women's experiences of pregnancy. Quickening is really a legal concept, a medical concept, as well as a bodily experience. Abortion opponents today say the word abortion never appears in the Constitution. That is one of many bases for their view that Roe versus Wade should be overturned. I mean, of course, that's correct, but I've always thought about this, and I'm interested in your take on it. Why would the framers of the Constitution or any political leaders anywhere in America at that time 
why would they have been concerned about this issue as far as putting it in founding documents or even state constitutions, legislation? It was considered a private matter. Yeah, exactly. So it was considered a private matter, had no place necessarily in the Constitution, especially it was considered the realm of women, right? And the realm of women was not a place that the Constitution really went. That's right. <laughs> Protect, yeah. So the protection of women's rights were not at the forefront of the founders' minds in the ways that we might think about it. And abortion was not on their minds, again, because it was a private thing that happened amongst women. In one of my recent episodes, I discussed with Kate Maser, a historian of the 19th century, the development of rights, how the Constitution did or did not protect civil rights for all people. A lot of this was left to the states. Abortion as a right, that did not exist at this period, right? The idea that abortion is a right, that's more of a 20th century thing. Right, exactly. What was the impetus for the change here? What happens in the mid-19th century where we see individual states begin to restrict abortion earlier in pregnancy? Again, we're using the term abortion in a modern sense, but what happens here? So I think there are a number of things that coalesce. The first thing that I already mentioned was abortion becomes more commercialized and therefore more out of the control of women, and again, less of a private matter as it becomes more commercialized. There were some high profile deaths that were published in newspapers and that people were aware of. And it's largely those newspaper accounts that are responsible for some of these early legislative restrictions on abortion at the state level. Illinois, the 1827 law, they restricted this under the Poisoning Act. And so it had to do with that commercialization of abortion and the sending of abortive patients in the mail. So there was this awareness and concern for the number of women who were dying from unsafe and unregulated abortion practices. And I'd say that that is really what's behind the early 1800s laws that come into play. If we're thinking a little bit later, in the 19th century. So between 1860 and 1880, basically abortion becomes illegal at all stages of pregnancy. How does that happen, right? How do we get from this colonial period where abortion is widely practiced, widely accepted, the common law acknowledges this as being legal, taking place prior to quickening. How do we get from there to by 1880, abortion being illegal in almost all circumstances across the United States. Well, we have a lot of things going on in the late 19th century that are at play here. We have yeah. nationalism, immigration, imperialism, the first organized feminist movement that are coloring people's understandings and concern about population growth. And there was a real worry at the time whether women, particularly white women of Northern European descent, would continue to reproduce at the rates that they wanted them to in order to secure these imperial holdings, in order to protect the nation should war break out. So there's a real concern about population in the late 19th century. And there's a real concern about certain kinds of population. So there's a nativist movement in the United States that is very vocal about the reproduction rates of immigrants, particularly Catholic immigrants from countries like Ireland, from countries like Italy, and the fact that they're perceived to be reproducing at a much higher rate than, again, white women of Northern European descent. So there's this population concern. That's going on at the same time that we see the professionalization of the American medical profession. So let's talk about the AMA and Horatio yeah. Storer, Dr. Horatio Storer. He's really the first anti-abortion crusader in American history. Where did he come from and why did he want to make abortion illegal? Yeah, Horatio Storer is an interesting person. He was not only one of the most fervent anti-abortion activists at the time, he was also one of the founders of American gynecology. And I think that those things need to be seen as related to one another. This is a time when the American medical profession is concerned about competition, particularly from homeopaths and midwives. They're trying to win professional power. They're trying to carve out these medical niches. Horatio Storer, right, is carving out this medical niche within gynecology. And there's this struggle for power 
within the realm of pregnancy and birth and who gets to determine things like when life is present, who gets to determine if a pregnancy is in fact present. Is it the woman who gets to determine that with quickening or is it a medical doctor who determines that? So there's this kind of struggle here between medical doctors and competitors like homeopaths and midwives, but also between medical professionals and their patients when we're dealing with pregnancy. And so Horatio Storer is going to capitalize on some of these concerns about population and initiate this crusade against abortion and try to win over the American Medical Association, get them on his side. They're going to try to outlaw abortion at every stage of pregnancy. But he is met with some resistance at first, right? Why was that? Well, I think that one of the reasons he's met with some resistance is because this was a longstanding practice, right? And a longstanding practice that was encompassed in culture and and the ways that, yeah, and common law, right? This approach to abortion and this approach also to pregnancy and who got to determine what when it came to pregnancy. The AHA's brief in the Dobbs case says, because of the hold of common law tradition, Storer's initial efforts immediately met resistance from his Boston colleagues when he proposed criminalizing all abortion and holding women criminally responsible, too. Several of those colleagues scoffed, reading from the brief here, one of them predicting that Storer would fail to convince the public that abortion in the early months is a crime. That was from Dr. Charles Buckingham in 1857. The Report Upon Criminal Abortions was the name of the the title of the document that he wrote. So how do things change then? One of the reasons it changes is because of this desire amongst American medical professionals to gain professional power, to control medical practice, to tamp down on competition from other people. And that that kind of aligns with the needs of the American medical professional at the time. And they are very successful They're very successful in destroying the legal idea of quickening and the medical idea of quickening by discrediting women's bodily experiences of pregnancy as unreliable and of claiming pregnancy and birth as medical terrain, not women's realm. So they're very successful at that, but they're not successful at destroying this cultural idea of quickening. Yeah, I was going to ask if the public bought these arguments because his allies, Storr's allies, were doctors, not necessarily Christian moralists who are the opponents of many of the opponents of, not all, many of the opponents of abortion today. But in those days, there was no pro-life movement, Right. Right. So these doctors kind of ally with the state and are successful at having induced miscarriages that occurred prior to quickening labeled as now abortion. They're successful at equating abortion with infanticide and at having these ideas reflected in laws that are going to be passed across the country between 1860 and 1880. But they were not successful at changing the culture of abortion They were not successful at changing the everyday practice of it and the attitude toward it that was rooted in people's daily lives. Women continued to believe in quickening and they continued to believe that it was not immoral to induce miscarriage or to restore their periods um, prior to quickening. And they continued to seek out abortion even after the states they were living in banned it. Yes, They're continuing to seek out abortion. They're continuing to buy abortifacients and get them delivered through the mail in some cases. They're continuing to seek out surgical abortions. And I think it's really important to emphasize that abortions may have been criminalized, but there were still there was still access to legal abortions through these therapeutic abortions that the law allowed. And many doctors did not agree with Horatio Storer and did not agree with the American Medical Association. And when they were confronted with women who wanted to have abortions, they were quick to comply and and see it as falling within this range of what it meant to provide a therapeutic abortion, because that was really a gray area of what it meant, both legally and medically. Did women frequently die from these abortions? Because they sound dangerous to me. 
I think it depends on what you count as frequently. I mean, women certainly died from having abortions and from having specifically unregulated abortions after abortion was commercialized. I think that there are estimates, but these estimates range yeah. so widely. Um, There's no way to know for it, sure. Right. In the tens of thousands per year. And there That's are certain decades. Yeah, there are certain decades where there are more women who are going to die from abortion because maybe the therapeutic definition was more restricted in that period or because more women are seeking out abortions. So, for example, with the Great Depression, we see a huge increase in the number of women who are seeking out abortions and with it a kind of understanding for that and a liberalization of the therapeutic application of the law. No surprise that happened during the Great Depression. People believe they could not afford to bring children into the world at that moment. Returning briefly to the 19th century, just citing the brief one more time from the AHA, says as of 1868, nearly half of the states continued either not to prohibit abortion entirely or to impose lesser punishments for abortions prior to quickening. To your earlier point that there was still, despite what the laws may have read, this was still in play, right? We can't look back at the laws from any one period and believe that's how everyone behaved. I mean, this cultural acceptance and in some cases the law's recognition of this cultural practice is really going to go far into the 20th century. It, it doesn't go away just because abortion is criminalized. Yeah. Women continue to believe that what they're doing is moral, even if it's illegal. When does the notion that abortion is a privacy right start to emerge and maybe take over this prior understanding of what it was? I think that there are a lot of things that come into play in thinking about abortion as a right. So in the 20th century is where we see kind of abortion as a right emerge and a discussion and a rhetoric around that emerge. And I would tie that pretty closely to the emergence of the feminist movement and second wave feminism and a discussion of greater civic, civil and social rights that are taking place within the post-war period, particularly the 1960s. And so abortion is articulated as a right, just as many other things are articulated as a right during that period. It emerges then from the culture more than from legal rulings at first. So the right to privacy and its association with the 14th Amendment kind of goes back before we're thinking about abortion in particular, but thinking about privacy much more broadly. With the effort to decriminalize abortion that takes place really after the 1950s and into the 1960s, they're building on this groundwork that had been laid in court rulings about the right to privacy in the 14th Amendment that had recognized that people had a right to privacy in family matters, ranging from the right to bear children, to send children to private schools, and to interracial marriage. And so they're kind of building on this foundation of right to privacy over family matters in their effort to decriminalize abortion in the 1960s when they're bringing court cases. We have the Griswold case in the mid-60s. Yeah, Griswold is a very important case, but it it is just one case in in a series of cases that had established this right to privacy over family matters, particularly marriage and thinking about parenting. So, Anna Peterson, historian, what did you make of Samuel Alito's draft? Given everything we've been discussing here, what did you make of his draft ruling as far as historical accuracy goes? I thought it was troubling. I thought that there were a number of missteps and misrepresentations if we want to be generous with characterizing them. I think that there's a misuse of history that's taking place that is not grounded in the historical record or fact. Especially about the common law aspect of this, right? Yes. You're also an expert on abortion law and rights in Europe. Why in Europe does this issue seem to be less controversial than in the United States? Is it because abortion rights are decided by legislatures in Europe rather than a court ruling? I think that could certainly be a factor, but as a historian, I can also see there are you know paths that diverge within U.S. and European history of abortion and cultural attitudes toward it. And what starts to happen in the United States in the early 20th century is 
because abortion is illegal, but still widely accepted and practiced, there is a cultural campaign against abortion in which they make women who seek out abortions out to be frivolous, sinful, amoral, not to be trusted, dangerous women. Where in Europe, really, they never diverge from that path of seeing women and describing women who seek out abortions as being desperate, destitute, as having no other option. And so... Meaning the it wasn't feminist, sinful as we consider it right. today. It wasn't sinful. It wasn't frivolous. It was needed and only desperate women were seeking them out. That was the kind of rhetoric and the painting of the picture. Later then with the feminist movement, there's also a divergence in the feminist movement in the United States is really focused on this idea of abortion as a right, as this fitting with the idea of individual rights and about bodily choice and integrity. Where again in Europe, it's more about humanitarianism, it's about healthcare, it's about the collective. And so I think that there's just a different approach and attitude toward it, where in the United States, it's become pitted against kind of this idea of women having the right to their body and their right to make whatever choice they want, even if it's a sinful choice or an amoral choice, as it's painted to be, where in Europe, it's still seen as women who get abortions do so because they have to. So this talk of rights and this vocabulary around rights, generally speaking, is not happening in Europe. Is that what you're saying? It's legal there without it having to be a right. Right. Or the rhetoric <laughs> of rights is not taking yes. place. And also this this idea of choice is not emphasized in Europe in the way that it is in the United States, because it's seen in the United States as this needs to be women's choice. And we see a lot of rhetoric around that, where in Europe it's seen as there is no choice. This is what's necessary. And the vocabulary continues to evolve. The pro-abortion rights camp is debating this right now because it's going to fall into the hands of the states, meaning the democratic process will be restored when it comes to this right to have an abortion. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on that about the way language matters so much here, right? Pro-life versus pro-choice. I think we're seeing that dynamic changing a little bit. Yeah. And I think that Within the feminist movement, within the pro-choice movement, that now we're getting kind of beyond that and into broader discussions about equality, about health care, about access um, that goes beyond this kind of pitting of women against God, really, in this idea of frivolity and sin. Anna Peterson of Luther College. At about the same time Dr. Storr was pursuing his campaign to outlaw abortion at all stages of pregnancy, the country was dealing with a pretty major problem, Reconstruction. And in order to form a more perfect union, Congress passed and the states ratified three amendments designed to secure liberty, to secure the changes wrought by the Civil War. Columbia University's Eric Foner is the preeminent historian on this subject, and he is back on the podcast. Eric Foner, welcome. Uh, very nice to be here. As always, an honor to have you. You were the first historian I thought of when I was saying to myself, who should I speak to about the 14th Amendment? But before we dive into the 1860s, I'm curious to hear simply what's been on your mind lately as this controversy over the leaked Alito ruling in the Dobbs case unfolds. In particular, the fact that Justice Blackmun's opinion from the 1970s leaned very heavily on history. Indeed, the use of history to interpret the Constitution is in the news again. Yeah, I mean... I'm a historian. I think that justices of all political persuasions ought to be informed about history. But I am not a believer in what they call original intent or original meaning jurisprudence, which to my mind just locks us into outlooks, views of sometimes well over a century ago, you know. You want to go to the 14th Amendment and indeed all three Civil War era amendments, 13th, 14th and 15th, they all end with, you know, a section saying Congress will have the power to enforce this. In other words, they were based on the idea that Reconstruction was an ongoing process, that it was experimental. If Congress saw that one thing wasn't working, they try something else. If you try to freeze history at a certain moment and say, okay, what did these words mean 
at that moment, you're missing the dynamic of the era, which is radical change going on. So on the one hand, I think we need to know about history. What were they trying to accomplish with the 14th Amendment? But history it shouldn't just be the answer to every question of the year 2022. I don't know if you had a chance to check out the Amicus or Amicus. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. The, the <laughs> that brief... Amicus to yeah. me, but yeah. I may be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> the American Historical Association submitted a friend of the court brief about the history of abortion. I don't know if you had a chance to check that out. Well, I did, but, you know, I'm not an expert on this. I, I tend not to get involved in Amicus briefs. I think the imperatives of a historian are not always the same thing as the imperatives of a lawyer or a justice. Uh, But, you know, the American Historical Association comprises many hundreds of thousands of very qualified historians. So, you know, I I looked at the brief. I think it lays out the history of attitudes and laws about the common law about abortion quite well. But as I say, I'm not a justice. I'm not a law professor. I'm a historian and I'm a citizen. And to me, that's you know, one way of looking at this case, but not at all the only one. And I think Justice Alito's opinion and, you know, other discussions tend to miss out on what the 14th Amendment is actually all about. So the 14th Amendment, let's just lay out the scene a little bit. The Civil War is over. The 13th Amendment has already abolished slavery forever. That was ratified at the end of 1865. Congress passes a civil rights law in 1866, and the 14th Amendment, that very same year, it took two more years for the states to ratify it. Why did Congress, which was dominated by Republicans at this moment, basically the southern states weren't part of the U.S. again yet, why did they decide the 14th Amendment was necessary? (laughs) Because after Lincoln was assassinated, Andrew Johnson, one of the worst presidents in American history, and a man who lacked every one of Lincoln's qualities of greatness. Johnson became president. Johnson aligned himself very quickly with the white South. He was deeply racist. He didn't think that African-Americans should enjoy virtually any rights as free people. They should go back to work on the plantations and allow whites to pass the laws and govern the South. And he set up new governments in the South, which acted on that premises of uh, white supremacy and enacted all sorts of laws known as the Black Codes to try to force the former slaves back to work on the plantations. In other words, Congress acted because they saw that the fruits of the Civil War were being sort of squandered by President Johnson's Reconstruction policy. What would have happened if Lincoln had lived, of course, is an interesting question. People debate that's not history, it's speculation. But we do know what happened, which was this very important impasse and conflict between Johnson and the Republican majority in Congress. The purpose of the 14th Amendment is it's part of a general effort on the part of Congress to, in a sense, to use a modern phrase, regime change, to get rid of the old pro-slavery regime, which had controlled the national government, certainly dominated all the Southern states before the Civil War, to replace a pro-slavery regime with a anti-slavery or post-slavery regime in which all American citizens had the same rights, regardless of race, regardless of religion or any other consideration, and create a whole new system from the ashes of slavery. And to limit... And and that's not, you know, you can't just go to the language of the 14th Amendment and say, well, that's not, if they don't say regime change, I'm giving you a historical analysis, not a linguistic obsession with whether a certain word is in there or not. And that's, of course, Alito's position. Abortion is not mentioned in the Constitution. Therefore, there is no right to terminate a pregnancy. And the 14th Amendment was about limiting state power and extending congressional power to protect rights that many people had argued were embodied in the Constitution from day one, but were not explicit and the federal government could not enforce. Well, some Republicans said, yes, these basic rights of citizens were implicit in the Constitution. Now, remember, of course, the Bill of Rights begins with the words, Congress shall make no law. The Bill of Rights was widely, not universally, but widely assumed to apply 
only to the federal government. The federal government cannot suppress freedom of speech or freedom of religion, or uh, the federal government cannot uh, impose cruel and unusual punishments. Before the Civil War, it was widely thought those provisions did not affect the state governments. But it was the states that had established slavery. It was now the states that were passing the Black Codes, trying to take away the basic rights of the freed slaves. And so Congress concluded that the states had to be restrained. The federal government had become what Charles Sumner called the custodian of freedom. You needed the federal government to override the states when they were trying to you know, limit the basic rights of American citizens. But then you get to the question, what were the basic rights of American citizens? There was no universal agreement on that. Yes, abortion was common, but there were also anti-abortion measures. Abortion was not an issue. It's like, let's get to the next case where they're going to act probably gay marriage. There's no mention of gay marriage in the 14th Amendment, obviously. So therefore, we're supposed to say, well, that right doesn't exist anymore because in 1868, it was not a subject of public debate. That's ridiculous. If you move to a higher level of analysis, you will see that one of the most egregious crimes of slavery was the destruction of family life for many people, the loss of control over your own person. You know, abortion is, Alito wouldn't care about this and it doesn't matter, but abortion was practiced by slave women quite commonly before the Civil War for reasons one can figure out. Yeah. They did not want their unborn child to become a slave. Doesn't that count somewhere? This is a Congress that is trying to get rid of the legacies of slavery. And one of the most horrific legacies of slavery was the widespread rape of black women in the South by white people, owners and others, almost never punished in any way. Slaves were property. They did not have the right to control their own person. Bodily integrity was one of the things that was associated with the concept of freedom and uh, now in the 13th and 14th Amendment. But you have to then go back and think about slavery a little bit, which you don't get any sense of that in Justice Alito's opinion here. There were many outstanding issues the 14th Amendment was designed to resolve. I just interviewed Kate Mazur about her book and rights we might take for granted today or just definitions of words to the modern reader might be stunned to learn that at that time there was no consensus over what it meant to be a citizen. Right. So birthright citizenship Absolutely. was a big part of the 14th Amendment. Absolutely. The 14th Amendment is an attempt to answer not all, but certainly a lot of the questions that emerged from the Civil War and the destruction of slavery. Who should be a citizen of the United States? Remember, obviously, the Dred Scott decision in 1857 had said that no black person can be a citizen. It's for whites only. The Civil Rights Act of 1866, which you mentioned, and now the 14th Amendment, both include this birthright citizenship provision. Anybody born in the United States is a citizen. It doesn't matter what race they are, what religion, what national origin, etc. Okay, that's one question settled. Who is a citizen? Then you get to who should have the right to vote. No state gave women the right to vote at this time, but abolitionists and black people themselves were agitating for the right to vote for black men. The 14th Amendment doesn't solve that problem. It's a compromise. Section 2 leaves it in the hands of the states who can vote, but says if states deny any group of men the right to vote, they're going to lose some of their representation in Congress. So if, let's say, Mississippi, well, let's say Alabama is about 50 percent black, 50 percent white. If Alabama does not give black men the right to vote, they're going to lose 50 percent of their members of Congress. Now, that has never been enforced. The Supreme Court has always ducked it. They don't want to enforce that. But it's in there in the 14th Amendment. But it becomes moot in a way because a couple of years later, you get the 15th Amendment, which is meant to directly guarantee the right to vote to African-American men throughout the country, not just in the South. There are many other provisions of the 14th Amendment having to do with the national debt, having to do with barring monetary compensation to white Southerners for the loss of their slaves. There's a provision that people who took an oath to support the United States or the Constitution and then 
engaged in insurrection cannot hold public office. So it's trying to remake the governments of the South. It's trying to define what the rights of American citizens are, who is a citizen. The first section puts the word equal into the Constitution for the first time, equal protection of the laws. No longer can you have black codes, one set of laws for blacks, one set of laws for whites. You know, this is an entire context of historical change. And to extract the issue of abortion and say, well, that really doesn't, it doesn't exist, the word. They're talking in general principles, not necessarily specific rights. So we should look to history, but we have to have a broad understanding of what that history actually is. You make this point in your book in 1988, when you reference the debates at the time about the wording of the amendment, its ambiguity. I mean, maybe to the modern reader, this seems very clear, but nothing is that easy when it comes to the Constitution. You say, uh, yet to reduce their aims to this, you were referring to um, the idea that the 14th Amendment was only for the rights of black people. You go on, as I read your own words to you here, is to misconstrue the difference between a statute and a constitutional amendment. Some amendments dealing with narrow immediate concerns can be thought of as statutes writ large, altering one aspect of national life. But you also go on to say that others are broad statements of principle, giving constitutional form to the resolution of national crises and permanently altering American nationality. There's a dynamic process at work here. It's not static. Right. Well, you know, my more recent book on these constitutional amendments is called The Second Founding. And the purpose of that title is to suggest exactly what you just read, that the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments fundamentally change the Constitution. They're not just minor little alterations in an existing structure. They create a new system of federalism with the federal government elevated above the states. They create a definition of citizenship, as you said. They put this principle of equality of all Americans into the Constitution. It's a new constitution, the one we are living with, and I hope will continue today. So, you know, Alito says, well, all right, the word abortion is not in there. The word privacy is not in the constitution either. But for the past 60, 70 years, the courts have ruled that the notion of liberty, which is in the constitution, includes a strong protection for privacy. And of course, Griswold and Obergefell and now Alito's opinion anyway, are trying to define whether this right to privacy really exists or not. But again, the way that they go about it is blinkered. It's so narrow. They don't really, Alito anyway, judging from this, they don't consider the real historical context within which people are trying to work out the consequences of the abolition of slavery for this country. The word that's used is penumbras, that there was an implied right of privacy in several of the amendments to the Constitution prior to the 14th Amendment. The Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, due process, police can't just barge into your home without a warrant. Right. And and as you mentioned, in the 1960s, the uh, Griswold case, which dealt with contraception, That was the first Supreme Court case that had a majority opinion ruling in favor of a right to privacy. So it it took a while from the 1860s to the 1960s because in the 1860s, there was no debate about privacy, but there were debates about due process and equal protection. Yeah, I mean, and let us remember that for most of our history, certainly for nearly a century after its ratification, the Supreme Court just whittled away at the 14th Amendment to make it almost ineffective in the southern states. As we know, it it accepted Plessy v. Ferguson. It accepted state-mandated racial segregation as acceptable under the equal protection of the law language of the 14th Amendment. It allowed states to nullify the right to vote for black men in the South. I mean, from the 1890s all the way into the 1960s. We had a 15th Amendment trying to guarantee that right to vote for black men. The Supreme Court just abrogated it fundamentally for decades and decades. Certainly, as Missouri's book shows, many anti-slavery people have been fighting for the right of 
African Americans to enjoy public accommodations, to equal treatment on transportation, hotels, theaters, public businesses, public venues had to, they felt, had to accept African Americans on an equal basis. They thought that the 14th Amendment would allow laws protecting that, but the Supreme Court in 1883 said, no, sorry, 14th Amendment only applies to state government, state action. If a private business wants to discriminate against black people, that's their decision. It doesn't bother us one way or the other. In other words, you can't understand the meaning there unless you go back to what Missouri is talking about, the anti-slavery struggle and the effort through that to create a new concept of American citizenship and American rights. But I'm sorry to say that, and this is not any particular person now, but over the course of our entire history, certainly since the Civil War, the Supreme Court generally has tried to narrow the 14th Amendment when it comes to race. When it comes to other issues, like the rights of corporations, they have tremendously expanded it. By the way, the word corporation isn't in the 14th Amendment either, is it? But the courts have ruled, no, well, uh, they meant corporations when they said you cannot deprive any person of liberty without due process of law. Obviously, they meant corporations. I said, well, wait a minute, how do we know they meant? Well, uh, I believe corporations are legal persons, and they must have believed that back then. There is nothing in the 14th Amendment that upholds that interpretation, and yet the court has accepted it for a century. Nothing in the contemporaneous debates as well. I want to Not ask you. Word. I want Not to ask word. you about those debates right now before we leap to the 1870s. In terms of chronology, the South, as I mentioned earlier, still not part of the Union. They, the Southern states don't start joining again until that year, 1868, and that process is completed in 1870. So while the 14th Amendment is being debated in Congress, it's just the North. But there was no unanimous opinion on this, right? There were very close right. votes, close votes in the committees. Let's, let us avoid, and I do this myself, so this is not a criticism. Let us avoid using the words the South to only apply to white people. There were millions of black people who were part of the South, and they were holding political conventions, and they were petitioning Congress, and they were putting out their ideas about what liberty was and equality was, and they were pressing their demands on Congress. And yet their voice is almost never heard in these debates about the 14th Amendment. Does Alito's opinion say anything about black people? They don't exist as far as he's concerned. You know, there's this tendency to think it's the that the South is those well-to-do people in the South who ran the South before the Civil War. So I'm not I'm not criticizing you for in effect saying that, but the South was not represented. Andrew Johnson had set up these white supremacist governments. Congress refused to seat the people elected to Congress by those governments. Basically, in the Reconstruction Act of 1867, Congress said, you got to have better governments in the South. And they said, finally, and black men have to now vote. We're going to have new elections in the South. We're going to set up new governments, which will be interracial. There'll be democracy for the first time in Southern history. Then you get the 14th Amendment ratified, because now you have black men in the legislatures in the South voting for it. But what did those black men think they were accomplishing? You know, the Supreme Court doesn't look at that at all. So you say, let's look to history, but which kind of history are we actually going to be examining here? That's a fair criticism. So with that in mind, in Congress in 1866, there were debates about the language being too broad, too ambiguous, and it was the people who opposed the 14th Amendment who were making the argument that it was too broad, right? right after the debates on the Civil Rights Bill. They spent the whole spring debating. I mean, it's a, it's a remarkable moment in American history. We don't normally have a situation where for week after week after week, the Congress is debating what it is to be an American and what rights come to you as an American and who is a citizen and what is equality and what is liberty. And there was no one opinion on that, obviously. There were plenty of people voting and there plenty of people who had divergent. Everyone knew slavery was dead. There was no one there saying, well, let's get slavery back, folks. You know, that's really the best system. No. But once you go beyond that and we say four million people are now free, what's their status going to be? 
And then, of course, the women's rights movement has said, well, wait a minute, what about the rights of women here? If equal protection of the law is going to be our principle now, well, what about the inequalities of women? That gets us down into the common law of coverture and the denial of women of basic rights in the common law. To rest your opinion here on the common law, as Alito does, is absurd because the common law is structured on inequality between men and women through the doctrine of coverture, that men are the represent the family to the outer world. Women have no rights in that regard. One of the more depressing aspects of this whole story is that it doesn't take very long for the United States Supreme Court to basically say the 14th Amendment doesn't do what it says it does. We can start with the slaughterhouse case brought by white butchers who believe that their due process rights were being violated. What was the importance of the slaughterhouse case, 1873? It's not really their due process rights. It's their rights, their privileges and immunities of citizens. That's right. But that is important because, as I said before, Slaughterhouse destroys that part of the 14th Amendment. The Slaughterhouse case was brought by white butchers, not by former slaves. The state of the interracial government legislature, biracial legislature of Louisiana, had passed a law establishing a monopoly on the slaughtering of animals for meat in New Orleans, that this is a public health measure. In other words, a lot of the junk from slaughterhouses went into the Mississippi River and polluted it very badly. Many states were passing public health laws like this, but uh, it's now a monopoly. If if a butcher wants to have his cows slaughtered to sell meat, he's got to go to this monopoly place. He can't do it by himself as in the past. The butcher sued saying, well, wait a minute, This was a war over slavery and free labor, the right of free labor to pursue a livelihood, to choose your occupation, is being violated here by the state government, which is imposing this monopoly and thereby depriving many other butchers of the ability to pursue a livelihood as free laborers. And therefore, it violates the 14th Amendment, the Privileges and Immunities Clause, that the right of free labor is one of the privileges of American citizens. The Supreme Court said, no, sorry, the butchers don't really have a case here. Now, you could say they don't have a case because these kind of laws are very common and the the states have the right to pass public health measures, but that's not what they really said. Uh, What they said was that these rights that they're claiming still come from the states. The 14th Amendment did not actually increase the rights of anybody in relation to the federal government. Now, by the way, that's exactly, that's what Congress thought they were doing when they passed the 14th Amendment, was increasing your national rights. But they said the privileges and immunities of citizens actually haven't changed at all. They don't actually amount, well, well, what are the privileges and immunities of citizens? Supreme Court said, well, There's the right to travel on navigable waterways. All right, that's not that important to most people most of the time. (laughs) Uh, There's the right to protection on the high seas from pirates. The federal government's got to, you know, we don't want pirates kidnapping American citizens. Not many slaves were likely to be, ex-slaves were likely to be affected by protection against piracy. You can go to Washington and hold a meeting to petition the government. All right, that's good. But again, it's not that easy to get over to Washington for this. But the basic rights of citizens remain in the states. And therefore, the law in Louisiana can't be judged on the basis of the of federal rights. It's a state government and states have a right to pass laws like this. It doesn't violate anything. So basically, they said the Privileges and Immunities Clause cannot be used in opposition to a measure by the state governments. But again, the 14th Amendment is meant to limit the state governments and to exalt the federal government as a protector of people's basic rights. So all the debates, right? All the debates in the 18th. I think most legal historians today think that Slaughterhouse was definitely wrongly decided, but it is still good law. That's we astonishing. With Roe v. Wade over about precedent. Should you overturn precedent? Well, this is a case I think should be overturned, even though it's 150 years old. That's remarkable. All the debates of the 1860s. And then the Supreme Court comes up with this ruling. It's just amazing. Well, you know, Justice Bradley, I think it was in his dissent, says 
maybe it was another one. There was a five to four decision. One of the four, and I can't remember which one, maybe it was Bradley. Uh, Justice uh, Field. Yes. Or Field, maybe. Okay, Field. If this is the meaning of the 14th Amendment, it unnecessarily created a giant debate. You know, in other words, what were they fighting over? What were they debating if the, if this measure is so narrow that it actually only doesn't really apply to anybody? But then, as I said, this was just the first step in a quarter century of abrogating the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. So that's what the Supreme Court has done in our history. You quote Justice Field in your 1988 book, as you put it, in his stinging dissent. He says, uh, if this were the amendment's meaning, it was a vain and idle enactment which accomplished nothing and most unnecessarily excited Congress and the people on its passage. Uh, So he was apoplectic about it. So 1876, another decision comes down. The U.S. versus Cruikshank, if I'm pronouncing that right. What was that all about? (laughs) That got into the question of if crimes are committed against the former slaves, can they be prosecuted by the federal government? In the South in the 1870s, you had rampant violence. You had the Ku Klux Klan. You had other terrorist organizations trying to prevent black people from voting, trying to prevent them from taking office if they were elected. You know, it was a very violent period, and the purpose of these organizations was to restore white supremacy. Congress passed a series of laws, the so-called Enforcement Acts, authorizing the federal government to prosecute people who committed acts of violence with the intention of depriving someone of a constitutional right. If you try to murder someone on their way to vote, let's say, that would fall under the... And President Grant in in 1871 sent the federal troops into the South to crush the Ku Klux Klan, citing the first Enforcement Act. The Crookshank case arose out of a massacre, the the Colfax massacre in uh, Louisiana, where some number, dozens anyway, of black people were murdered in cold blood by an armed white band which surrounded them in a courthouse. And then when they surrendered, killed dozens of them. A couple of people were convicted of violating the Enforcement Acts in a trial in New Orleans. Crookshank is one of them. Eventually, the Supreme Court overturns that conviction. And it says, again, the federal government doesn't really have the power. These are state matters. Murder is bad. They're not saying it's a good thing that people get murdered. But it's the state governments that should prosecute murders. Congress thought they were enhancing the power of the federal government. Supreme Court says, nope, nope, nope. It's up to the states here. Now, the trouble is many states were unable to prosecute these criminal actions So it basically said the federal government is not going to be able to intervene to protect the basic constitutional rights of the former slaves. Well, what kind of constitutional right is it that armed bands can deprive you of without any prosecution by the federal government? So, you know, again, Crookshank, you can run down these cases and I'm happy to do it. But the overall message is limiting the scope of the Civil War or the Reconstruction Amendments when it comes to African-American people. I think the theme or the thread that we can trace all through American history here is the issue with having states decide is if we agree as a country, there are certain rights that are so important that define what it means to be an American. They must have federal protection. And that's the argument now about abortion. I, I completely agree with what you just said. And it, it's not only abortion. Take the right to vote. What right is more essential to a political democracy than the right to vote? And yet this state is passing laws restricting the right to vote in this way. That state is passing other laws about the right to vote. There is no national standard of who has the right to vote. There are 50 different state laws And you can move from one state to another and lose your right to vote because the regulations differ from state to state to state. There are certain there are a few national laws. You cannot 15th Amendment. You can't deny someone the right to vote because of race. 19th Amendment. You can't deny the right to vote because of sex. But those are negatives. There's no positive statement of who actually should exercise the right to vote on a national level. And the radical Republicans in Congress said this 150 years ago. We are a nation. We should have a uniform system of voting in this country. Didn't happen. 
I suppose this is an intractable problem of our federalist system, which was designed to prevent a tyrannical federal government, but instead we get tyrannical state governments. Exactly. The, and we, as we said before, the first words of the First Amendment are, Congress shall make no law. They restrict the federal government because of the fear of a tyrannical national government. Each of the three Reconstruction Amendments ends with a section that begins, Congress shall have the power to enforce this. From Congress shall make no law restricting the federal government to Congress shall have the power empowering the federal government over the states. That is a fundamental shift in the federal system. And yet the Supreme Court seems very uncomfortable with it very much of the time. And if anyone objects to my using the word tyranny here, you just have to familiarize yourself with the way black people were treated in the post-Civil War South. I mean, that was a form of tyranny. The sad fact is that the Jim Crow system and all its uh, iniquities was, you know, the, the Supreme Court acquiesced in it. The Supreme Court allowed the abrogation of large parts of the Constitution in the southern states. It's a sad, not a, not a moment, it's a sad century almost in the history of the Supreme Court. And I believe that the current majority ought to be cognizant of what the court has done in the past and what that meant for large numbers of Americans, not only black people. The Jim Crow system was very oppressive to large numbers of white people as well in the South, poorer ones. If the right to terminate a pregnancy is now to be abolished or rescinded, uh, that will have a tremendous effect on the lives of American women and, of course, American men as well. And the court sometimes seems oblivious to the actual practical consequences of its rulings. Eric Foner, you're always welcome here. So we did cover a lot of ground in this episode, and if you're interested in learning more, read Eric Foner's Reconstruction. It is a must. And you can also go to my podcast page at WashingtonTimes.com, click on the page for this episode, and read the AHA's amicus brief in the Dobbs case. On the next episode of History As It Happens, we're going to stay in the 19th century with all the talk of replacement theory in the news these days, that racist conspiracy theory. We're going to discuss the 19th century's replacement theorists, the know-nothings. That's next as we report History As It Happens, a podcast from The Washington Times.